Hi guys, first of all, sorry for the very plain background. I am currently undergoing some huge bookcase renovations. So the next time you see me in a video, I'll hopefully be in front of my new video filming background. But it is the end of October and I couldn't pass up the opportunity of talking to you about Halloween. So today I'd like to share with you some of the Halloween research I've been doing as well as some Victorian Halloween book recommendations. So let's start with a brief history of Halloween and Halloween traces its roots right back to the pagan festival of Samhain. Samhain was a traditional festival celebrating the end of harvest so it was associated with new beginnings, the Celtic New Year and is also seen as the time when the veil between the two worlds were at its thinnest so the veil between our world and the supernatural world. But even this history is slightly more complicated than it seems and when you read more into it there are many different theories and many different scholars believe different things about Samhain and Halloween's relation to Celtic and Saxon traditions. So I'm going to stick to the more recent Halloween traditions and by more recent I want to talk about Victorian Halloween traditions. So despite knowing about its ancient roots and hearing lots about traditionally how Halloween was, I thought the Halloween we know and celebrate today was more modern and more commercial and it was this modern invention and it didn't really have much of a relation to the past. But when I started researching for this video I realised that I had been quite naive in thinking that because of course the Victorians had a hand in many of the celebrations that we have today and I found out some really funny quaint stories and lots of really interesting stuff that I wanted to share with you. In 1786 the Scottish poet Robert Burns published his poem Halloween and whilst it's not one of his most famous ones today, the images that he creates in it show us what it was like to celebrate Halloween in Scotland at the end of the 18th century. Robert Burns in the footnotes to his poems said that Halloween is thought to be a night when witches, devils and other mischief-making beings are abroad on their baneful midnight errands, particularly those aerial people, the fairies, are said on that night to hold a grand anniversary. His poem wasn't the first to talk about Halloween in this way, but it certainly was a very influential poem and you can see that the key components in it, the key ideas he discusses, still do relate to things that we recognise about Halloween to this day. I don't know about you, but nowadays I find that living in the UK and and being English, I and a lot of other people around me associate Halloween with America. I think because it has become this very commercial thing. But it might not be surprising to hear that the way that we celebrate Halloween was sent from us to America, in particular after the potato famine when Irish people immigrated to America they took their traditions to them and also English, Welsh and Scottish settlers when they moved to America and this is really how Halloween travelled across the ocean to reach the shores of America. As I was researching this video I came across a fantastic book from 1887 called How to Amuse Yourself and Others, The American Girl's Handy Book, which was written by Lena and Adelia B. Beard, who are actually the co-founders of the Girl Scout Society. They offered advice on parties, celebrations and occasions and also activities for young ladies at the time and they had a lot to say about Halloween. So I'll read to you some of the things that they said. It was the custom for quite a number of years of some friends of the writer to give a Halloween party on each recurring Halloween and merrier, jollier parties than those were it would not be easy to devise. The rooms and passages ways were decorated with and lighted by Chinese lanterns which produced a subdued glow in their immediate vicinity but left mysterious shadows in nooks and corners. We proceeded downstairs and into the kitchen where a large pot of candy was found bubbling over the fire. It was eaten at intervals during the evening as served to keep spirits up. So that was what it was like to be at a Halloween party but what actually went on? Well Halloween parties at this time and anything to do with Halloween 
queen was dominated by fortune telling and divining, which reminds me of that iconic scene from Jane Eyre, where Mr. Rochester dresses up as the old gypsy woman and tries to tell the fortunes of his guests. These Halloween games mainly revolved around finding out who the future husband of the young lady would be, and these kinds of parlour games were particularly popular with the middle and upper classes during the Victorian period. It wasn't really something that the lower or working classes could do or participate in, mainly because at this time there was still something called the Vagrancy Act of 1824, which meant that it was illegal for every person pretending or professing to tell fortunes or using any subtle craft, means or device by palmistry or otherwise to deceive and impose on any of his majesty's subjects. And that was around for quite a while, and even though it's not part of the law now, you might have heard of the Vagrancy Act in recent times, because this act is still in place and was in recent conversation when people were trying to prosecute homeless people in the UK, and they used this act to show that those homeless people should not be sleeping rough. The American Girl's Handy Book does discuss these kinds of divining activities in quite good detail, and I found these stories really funny. So one of the stories goes like this. We use melted lead to ascertain what the occupation of one's future husband would be. The fortune is told in this way. Each girl in turn holds a door key in one hand, while with the other hand she pours the melted lead from an iron spoon or ladle through the handle of the key into a pan of cold water. So you'd have a key, you pour your lead through the handle, and at the bottom you have a pan of cold water, and the shapes that are caused by the lead falling show what occupation your future husband will have. So if the lead falls and forms the shape of a boat, your husband's gonna be a sailor. If it falls and shows a book, your husband could be a professor or he could be a minister. If it just forms droplets, then you'll either stay single forever or your husband will have no occupation. So I thought like that one's quite interesting. Not sure how accurate that might be, but it seems fun, right? In another Halloween fortune telling game, you take an English walnut, chop it in half, take out the kernel, and then you use those two halves, put a taper in them, and then put them on water, and the direction that the walnut goes in says lots of different things about your relationships with the people around you. So the girls would keep a careful eye on their walnut, Walnut. and if two walnuts come into contact with each other then the owners would meet and have close contact during their lives and if two of the boats cross paths with each other then that means the same thing. If one of the so-called boats touches the side and won't leave it then it shows that you'll be a stay at home and if it often touches the side then it shows that you will go on short voyages and then the opposite is also the case. So if it doesn't touch the side a lot then you might go on some long travels during your life. Back in England and similar things were going on and Halloween had different names. So in the north of England it was referred to as Nutcrack Night because of the nuts that were consumed. You didn't really have candy as the Americans called it. It was a big time for nuts and fruits and it was also called this because of the powers that the nuts held to divine love affairs. In the Midlands and the south of England Halloween was called Snap Apple Night, which I really love. And in Nottinghamshire, one of my favourite stories is that there was a tradition that girls would take Pippin apples and they would take two or choose two and name them after their lovers. And whichever fell from the tree first would be the most inconstant lover and was likely to cheat on you, which I really love. I feel like if we had Pippin apple love divining now, there would be far less problems in relationships. <laughs> We often associate Halloween now with dressing up, and even though it did happen during the Victorian period, I'm kind of hesitant when I see those kinds of dressing up pictures that you might associate with the Victorian period, because I feel like when you're looking at those very staged pictures, then they have been staged and aren't representative of society as a whole. And fancy dress parties were popular during the Victorian period, but they came and went out of fashion. So there was some dressing up, and the images or photographs 
podcasts that you'll see do depict quite traditional images of fairies, witches, angels, and very supernatural beings. But in fact, some of my favourite kind of creepy Victorian traditions aren't entirely related to Halloween, but I might do a video at some point on the Victorians and death traditions, which I really love. The other thing probably to mention about Halloween is that now we carve pumpkins, and even though this did sometimes happen, traditionally turnips would have been used to carve jack-o'-lanterns, so they were called neeps in Scotland, and it was definitely a Scottish tradition that then carried through everywhere else, but I really like the idea of carving a turnip. And in fact, one of my favourite YouTubers, Bernadette Banner, who does historical costuming, recently made a video where she carved a turnip for Halloween at the same point, which I really loved. So that's how the Victorians celebrated Halloween. And now I'm going to recommend you some books that were written during the Victorian period that you might like to read around Halloween time. These are some of my favourite books that have uh, quite gothic themes or are very creepy or atmospheric and I can't wait to share them with you. So let's start by talking about Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This was first published in 1847 and there are so many things that you will love if you're reading it at this time of year. I feel like I couldn't read this in the summer because it's so ideal to read when the nights are drawing in, when things are getting darker, when the rain is hammering against your windows, that is the best time to read it. Wuthering Heights follows two families, the Earnshaws and the Lintons, and numerous generations of these families, set amongst the backdrop of the bleak Yorkshire moors. You have Heathcliff who has been brought into the family you have Kathy, who is a very spoilt girl who knows her own mind, who wants exactly what she wants, and will marry Edgar Linton despite the fact that she doesn't really love him, but she thinks that it's the proper thing to do. You have images of ghosts, you have the sublime, this gothic idea that nature is wild and a living, breathing thing that is all around us and is so powerful. There's this amazing, iconic scene early on in in the book where the narrator Lockwood goes into one of the bedrooms at Wuthering Heights and sees a hand outside and hears the voice of Kathy beckoning to come in at the window which then smashes and everything about this book screams Halloween. And so please, if you haven't read this yet, do it now. A book I don't talk about as much on my channel but still really love is Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. This is amazing. I want everybody to read this because I think it is a very underrated piece of Victorian fiction. It's about Laura and her father and it's set in Austria in this Austrian castle and it's about a young woman, Carmilla, who comes into her life. Laura and Carmilla become very good friends and it could be argued they become more than friends because I feel like Carmilla is a great example of early lesbian fiction. Even if J. Sheridan Le Fanu didn't mean it in that way, there are so many things that allude to that and I think that's one of the great ways that modern readers can relate to the story. It was the predecessor of Dracula so expect vampires and vampire illusions and death and scheming and supernatural goings on. I'm really excited to recommend the next book to you. It is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde which is one of the most horrific books in the best way possible that I have ever read. I love this book so much and it revolves around Dorian Gray who never ages but the portrait in his attic of him does and you go deeper and deeper into Victorian London in the much darker grimmer parts of it whereas Dorian and his associates are part of a much grander part of Victorian London so you get a great contrast between the two. There's one scene in this book in particular not to give any spoilers but I had to put the book down because I was so disgusted at the way that Oscar Wilde had described the thing that Dorian was doing. And you might be able to guess if you've read it what I mean by that, but I mean disgusted in the way of, oh my gosh, how have you described it in this way? Because 
I feel sick at how graphic this is. But that did not put me off. And in fact, I think it just adds to the masterpiece that is this book. I did an essay when I was at college on this in comparison to Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway and compared the two in relation to queer representation in classics, which I really loved doing. In the 1860s, sensation fiction became very popular. And so you'll often have a detective in the story who is trying to solve something that has happened. It might be some kind of injustice or some kind of crime and it will often highlight things that the Victorians were very worried about. Traditional Victorian things that were supposed to be proper and accepted in society would then be addressed in the book and would be seen in this very horrific way. So they were often quite controversial. And the first piece of sensation fiction I'd like to recommend to you is The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I read this last year and really loved it. This deal mostly with marriage and what can go wrong with the legalities of marriage. So our main character is Walter Hartwright and one day he sees a woman dressed in white and that leads him down this huge journey that lasts the whole book with numerous characters and at the heart of it a young woman who has been coerced into marriage and marries wrongly but she can't get herself out of it and basically loses her right to everything. I love this because even though Walter is kind of our detective figure, you also have Marianne Halcombe who is the sister to the character who is in trouble because of the marriage match that has been made. And Marion, I think, is one of the best Victorian characters and I wish that she had had maybe even a bigger role in the book. You have typical sensation images and tropes in this. For example, Wilkie Collins calls on the double, this idea of one person actually being two people but nobody really believing it. And there's a character called Count Fosco who gives me goosebumps because I find him so creepy. And I think Wilkie Collins weaves a really good story, although in places I felt like some of it could have been cut. And then the final Victorian book I want to recommend to you for Halloween this year is Lady Audley Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, which is the other sensation book I'd like to recommend to you. I've recently finished this and let me tell you, I am obsessed. I loved this book so much. I mean, I love all of these books, but this one I have read recently and I just want to talk about it with everybody I meet because I adored it. I mentioned that I thought The Woman in White could have been cut in places and I think this is a much better example of a really tight plotting to a sensation novel. This has a great plot but I kind of don't want to talk about it too much because I feel like so much happens in it that I could easily give away spoilers and I don't want to do that. So I will tell you that the story really starts with the return of a man called George Talboys to England. He has been in Australia and he left his wife and child in in England destitute after being cut off from his father to make a fortune in Australia and the book begins with him coming back to England. When he returns he finds that his wife has died. But also going on you have Lady Audley who has recently married Sir Michael Audley but nobody really knows where she's come from. She has a mysterious past and she doesn't really say anything about her childhood or growing up. She just appeared one day and it was like she started a new life. Lady Audley is an amazing anti-heroine and there are some great things in this like murder, there's so much intrigue, there is some really interesting detective skills that even though you might be one step ahead as the reader, you kind of won't be and so you're constantly kept on your toes and you really want to find out what happens. I'm hoping to read so many more of Mary Elizabeth Braddon's books after reading this because I was hooked from start to finish and I also loved her writing style which I found very beautiful, very descriptive and very talented too. It tells you so much about humankind and humanity and I really loved all of the characters in this. The characters you're supposed to like, the ones you aren't supposed to like, even the villains 
still have their moment to shine, which I really loved about it. So hopefully now, after watching this video, you will be fit to throw your own Victorian Halloween party or get your Victorian Halloween reading underway. I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, I'd love to know your feedback on this information and book recommendation style. And I'd also love to know if you are hoping to read any Victorian Halloween books this year. Happy reading!